Nina was gracious enough, she did a video with us last fall uh, for uh, kind of to show students uh, the path of what a game designer's life is like. And it's one of the pop most popular videos that we've posted in this series. Um, and so we're super excited to invite her here to Web Visions to talk about how to make uh, indie games with small teams. Cool. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Nina Freeman. Thanks for having me at Web Visions. It's really cool. Thanks, Brad, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, so my name is Nina, and I make and design video games. Um, so last November, uh, I released a game called Civil with my team, Star Made Games. Um, and today I'll be telling you a little bit about what the process for making that was like and what the design process was like. And uh, before I start all that though, some of you might not be familiar with my work, so I'll give you a little background on who I am and what I've been up to. Um, so, here we go. So I, <laughs> was like, how do I talk about myself? Uh, so I thought it might be funny to Google myself and to use that as the information for this slide on my background. And I found this like Wikipedia or Google snippet when you Google my name that says, Nina Freeman is a video game designer known for games with themes of sexuality and self-reflection. She is currently a designer at Fulbright. She was included in Forbes 2015 list of influential video game industry figures. Okay, cool, all true stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm like looking at it and it says I was born in 2012, which would make me four years old. Uh, so I don't know how that happened, but I don't think I'm four years old, although the internet knows all, so maybe I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> so yes, right now I'm working at Portland-based company Fulbright um, and I'm a level designer on, their, on our current game, Tacoma. Um, and prior to my work at Fulbright, I made games in my spare time and during graduate school at New York University. Um, these games were almost all based on personal experiences that I had and were basically snapshots of those experiences. Um, and I like to refer to them as vignette games. And if you don't know what a vignette is, it's like sort of a character study or a brief episode or examination of something very concise. Um, and I think I'm probably best known uh, for other than Sybil for this game called How Do You Do It, um, which is the image on the screen in the bottom right corner. Um, and that game is about a young girl who is trying to figure out how sex works by banging her Barbie dolls together in a variety of ways, kind of like this. So you as the player kind of play as her as she's like mashing her dolls together and is like, I saw Titanic, there was sex in that, I wonder what it's like. Um, <laughs> so, and this is like obviously based on a true experience I had when I was younger. Um, and so while I was working on these small games, largely just with my friends or in classes, I discovered my interest in designing for player character embodiment. So in other words, designing games that help players embody characters that are different from themselves. So games that let players perform as characters, almost like in a play. Um, so that's what brings me to Sybil, which is a game that I designed specifically to support player character embodiment of the main character, Nina. So for those of you who haven't played Sybil or who aren't familiar with it at all, Sybil is a game about a girl named Nina who has a relationship with a guy in an online game. So think like a World of Warcraft, an EverQuest, a MUD, something that you're playing, a game that you're playing online with tons of people. Um, and in Sybil, the player plays as Nina as she becomes closer to her lover, Blake, until they eventually decide to meet up in real life to have sex. So I'll show you the game's trailer, our release trailer, just to give you a sense of what it looks like and how it plays, um, especially if you haven't played it before.
Okay, so that's the Sybil release trailer, um, and it shows all of that is gameplay footage, um, in addition to some of the short films that are in the game. So basically, uh, the player, as you can see, plays as Nina, using her computer and playing the online game with Blake as her relationship with him unfolds. Um, and yes, the main character is based on me because this game is based on a true story from my own life. But before I get into that, uh, just for those of you who haven't played, it's a point and click game. So you just like point around the screen and click. Um, and the first segment sort of opens with a short film of the girl, of Nina, sitting at her computer. And then it cuts to first person view. So it's like kind of like you're sitting in her chair looking at her desktop. And from there, you're able to like click through all her folders and her apps and stuff embodying her by sort of sitting in her chair and then logging into the game and playing along with the Blake character and hearing this voiceover as if you're almost like Skyping with him while you play the game. Um, so you play this whole game sort of from this first person's perspective and it's sometimes broken up by these short films just to remind the player, you know, this is the character that you're playing as, this girl, Nina. Um, so before I dive into how we made the game and what that process was like, I just want to clarify where it's at right now. Um, so like I said, I think before, the game came out on November 2nd of last year. Um, Wired said that Sybil is a crazy game about falling in love online. Vice said Sybil is one of the few games to get sex right. Ah, oh, it makes me happy, the praise. Uh, and we recently won the Nuovo Award for Sybil at the Independent Games Festival last March. So we've done pretty well, um, which is really exciting and a huge surprise to the whole team. And I think it was surprising because it's not like we had a big budget or a studio backing or a publisher for that matter. Um, we were just a group of friends who came together because we have fun making games and we love games. Um, so we made Sybil entirely on weekends and after work or school over the course of a year and a half. Um, and it was a small side project for us, but it definitely grew into something much larger than we initially expected. So how did it start? Uh, I was in Bennett Foddy's prototype studio class at NYU in 2013 while I was working on my master's. Um, at, and at this point, I'd already made a bunch of games, like the ones I showed on that slide earlier, including how do you do it? So I had experience making games and was making small, like little vignette games. And then I was in this class where we were making a game a week. So the prototype class was like a game jam every week. So I had a week to make a prototype for a whole semester. It was, it was a really hard class. Um, and one of the weeks we had a little say in what the theme was. So every week our prototype would be based on a theme. Um, and for this one week, uh, we were like supposed to have a vote, but my friend Francisca and I decided that it would be funny to see what kind of sex theme game our classmates would make. Uh, so we pitched that as the theme and the class ran with it. Uh, but we kind of like forced them into it. Uh, so when I was brainstorming for my prototype for this class, uh, I was trying to focus on my teen years uh, because we'd already done How Do You Do It, which was a game about like childhood sexuality. So I wanted to like look at a different part of my life. Um, and obviously teen years, I don't know about you guys, but they're fraught with weird and interesting stuff to do with sex because you're just kind of like learning about yourself and figuring out what all of that is about. Um, and this kind of reflection is usually how I start when I want to make a game. I reflect and find something from my own life experience or the life experience of a real person I know and use that as a starting point. Um, so as I was reflecting, I came to the memory which Sybil was based on. So I did really meet up with a guy who I was sort of in a relationship with in Final Fantasy Online uh, when I was around 18. So basically the game follows the relationship between these two from when they're like kind of flirting to when they decide to actually meet up and have sex. And then that happens in the game. Um, and the, in real life, myself and this guy had been in this sort of flirtatious situation for quite some time uh, when we decided that he'd fly from California to New York City to visit me. Uh, and we did have sex. It was my first time having sex. And yes, he left because he wasn't all that into me and I was sad, etc. This is all addressed in the game. It's not spoilers because the game is like, it's a vignette. It's just the interest is in the details and how it unfolds rather than the plot. Um, so Sybil is based on this scenario. And I want to emphasize that I don't actually consider it to be an autobiographical work, although a lot of people talk about it in those terms. Um, for me, the story is not exactly true to the moment to moment of this real scenario that I was just describing, even though it does make use of that story and use of much ephemera from my own life and I play myself. Um, it's more of a piece of fiction that's based on a true story. So, you know, there's lots of films like this where they take a life story and sort of 
weave a narrative out of a real life story, but it's still like kind of semi-fictional. That's sort of what Sybil is. Um, so now that I've explained that stuff, I'll show you the prototype that I made for the class uh, that I'm describing. And this is always really embarrassing because the prototype is awful. <laughs> uh, but it's called, and it's also titled, you can't see it because it's on my desktop, but it's titled sex.swift. Okay, so that, that gets the idea across. Uh, let me get back to my slide. Um, slideshow. So keep in mind, I made that in a week when I was in graduate school, so that happened. Uh, and next slide. Okay, so. Okay, so I was pretty happy with the direction of this prototype uh, and with some and a lot of encouragement from Bennett, my professor, who, was, who thought it was a good idea, I decided to flesh out the game outside of class and ended up deciding to build it out as part of my master's thesis project. Um, so I decided that I would take the core idea and story of this prototype and break it up into a three-act structure because as much as I liked that one little game, I felt like I could flesh it out a little more and have sort of three segments that make up one larger vignette about them actually meeting, rather than it just being about these like online game conversations. Um, so I decided on the three act structure with, which e with each act focusing on a different part of their relationship. Um, and through that, having the player play as Nina through this vignette while she chats and plays along with Blake in this sort of like point and click online game setting. Um, this was the sort of broad idea I started with, and that's when I started to invite some friends to work on it with me. So here's a little collage I made of the team. Uh, we don't actually have a group picture, unfortunately, because about halfway through the project, uh, I finished grad school, and Emmett, my partner, and I uh, moved across the country here to Portland um, so that I could work at Fulbright. Um, and I'll get into that situation a little bit later, but at the start, when we first started making Sybil and I was inviting these people to work with me, all of us were based in New York City, um, and each of these people were friends of mine that I invited to work with me because I thought they either enjoyed making games or would be into the story that I was trying to tell. Um, and I didn't have the ability to pay any of them up front for their work, so I was really asking them to help me out as friends. I also promised that we could work out some sort of revenue share if we decided to sell the game which we did. When we started making it, I thought maybe I'd release it for free, because that's what I'd always done in the past, but we did decide to sell it. Um, so I was really lucky to have so many talented friends that were willing to put valuable time into development, despite my inability to pay them for their work until much later in the process. Um, so working with friends is not always the best way to go, but for me at the time, I was a student just making ends meet, and I was, you know, in school and I had a job and I had all this stuff. I didn't have enough money to pay them. Uh, and working with friends was the norm. That's what everyone in my program was doing basically. Um, and it was really the only option I had if I wanted to make a game on the scale of Sybil. So I did have the ability to make games by myself, but I didn't want to just be working on it by myself forever. I wanted to finish it within a reasonable amount of time, so I needed some support. Um, so I, I also want to note that Emmett, Decky, and I had done numerous game jams together at this point and released all those games online for free. Um, so we had a bunch of experience working together and releasing finished games. Um, and I think that the experience we'd gained from game jams, which if you're not familiar what a game jam is, it's basically a small sprint or like a hackathon where you make a game in a weekend. Um, 
And working together in that capacity really helped us understand how to work on Sybil and had given us the time to get to know each other's working methods, which I'm sure a lot of you know can be really helpful. Um, I do think that if you're gonna work with friends on a large scale project, be sure to try some smaller weekend or low commitment projects first, just to make sure you mesh well together with them. Uh, so I want to note here that Sybil did start as a student project. It didn't really end that way because we finished it after I was in school and after all of us were doing other stuff. Um, and not all the folks, even when we started, were students, but I was, and I was the project lead, and it was a game I was largely starting for my master's thesis. Um, and I think it's important to bring this up because, yes, you can be a student, start a project, ship a polished product, and sell it and do really well for yourself. Being a student doesn't mean you have to release your work for free um, or that it's less valuable in any way. Just saying. <laughs> uh, so, of course, despite the fact that myself and most of the team had shipped small games together um, before at stuff like Game Jams, we weren't all that experienced with shipping something on the scale of Sybil. Um, and we definitely weren't experienced with long-term game development projects. Uh, so we learned a lot about these things very quickly because uh, we thought Sybil was going to be super small, but it turns out what we thought would be a small game wasn't very small and took us a year and a half to make, which we did not expect. Uh, so once the team was assembled, I started to prototype with them and I started to flesh out the mechanics and story. Uh, the, initial prototype, uh, the initial prototypes that we made together were based on that one I showed you earlier, and they were passive. So I felt at this point that they were too passive because when we were playtesting, players were listening and reacting to that conversation that's happening while you're playing and learning things about the characters through that, but they weren't coming away with anything more than a surface level understanding that like two teens were chatting and flirting online, um, and it was more about them watching that happen rather than embodying. Um, so I wanted the player to come away with more than that. Uh, so I asked myself, how could I do, how could I iterate on the design to help the player do more than just passively perform this character? I wanted to urge the player to read between the lines rather than just listening to the surface level conversations. I wanted them to start thinking from Nina, the character's perspective. Uh, so, of course, <laughs> before I had time to figure out how to support player character embodiment in Sybil, I started to design around it because it was a really hard question to answer. And I came up with this very Baroque fake online game for the alpha version. Um, and I thought that Sybil was going to have these like five large maps full of other characters like a real online game. And that you could talk to them and do group fights and sort of like simulate the online game experience in that way. Um, and I drew awful maps like this, which I'm super ashamed of now. <laughs> like, having worked professionally as a level designer, don't make levels that look like this. Don't do it. Um, so all this initial planning that I was doing ended up being way too complicated and full of extra maps and extra characters that didn't actually matter to the story I was trying to tell. Um, so part of the iterative process of making Sybil was making a design and initial prototype that was way too big and learning from that mistake. Um, this first version was more about simulating an MMO than about embodying the core love story um, in the game. Basically, I was giving too much emphasis to the game stage and not enough to the performance. So I quickly realized that I needed to cut all of the cruff from, that had made its way into the design during these first couple months. Really simulating an online game to a full scale was just too much for a team of four working on the weekends. and. We had no budget to speak of, so I had only the support that I could get. And this was just, I think that would be cool if someone did that, but it was too much for our team. Um, so Sybil needed to go back to being a focused vignette, um, a brief evocative account of this online relationship, rather than focusing too much on the online world itself. This wildly large scope design would only serve to distract the player from the story. Uh, so instead of creating a fully fleshed out online game simulation as the stage for the story, I decided to focus on developing a core flow and mechanic that would encourage embodiment um, on an individual, smaller, more concise scale um, so that the player could, you know, have focus. Uh, I guess that's the short version of what we went through for the first couple of months of development. So lots of bad prototypes and ideas bounced back and forth until we whittled it down to a structure that would carry through to the shipped game. And that structure is three acts with voiceover as you play online game sequences with Blake, the lover, supported by desktop ephemera in short films that serve to contextualize 
the conversations that happen during those segments. Um, and the mechanic that would support all of this in the game spaces that would help the player move the story forward would be the player clicking on icons in the game and opening things as if they were using their computer. So you saw the desktop before, right? The game moves forward based on the player opening a pop-up, opening an email, looking at something on their computer actively. Um, the conversations actually ensue because of this. So say the player opens an email, Nina will comment on that email and say something about it to Blake, and that moves the conversation forward. So if there are no inputs into the game for a while, the conversation will just die down. But as soon as the player starts making inputs again and looking at stuff in the game, then the conversation keeps going. So that's sort of how the game moves forward and how the core mechanic works. Um, and I thought, I thought that this was a good idea because it supports the natural flow of conversation. Because usually when you're talking to someone on, in an online game, you're not just sitting there doing nothing. You're playing the game, looking at your computer, doing all this stuff while you socialize. Um, so it kind of felt to me like we'd wasted a lot of time in these first couple months when this stuff was gelling. Uh, but in retrospect, it wasn't a waste at all. I learned a bunch of things, including how to embrace iterative design, so how to like throw away ideas and start new ones really quickly. Uh, I'd learned that the game needed more concise focus so that the player could be focused on the story and could you know, understand it at their own pace. Um, and I'd learned that it was easy to make extra work for myself where it wasn't needed. Uh, so these are all very important lessons that I was lucky enough to learn and that I had the resources to learn because I was a student. Um, I had the time to expend iterating on this stuff. I wasn't you know, working with a publisher where I had harsh deadlines. I was kind of working on my own schedule. Um, and I was lucky to have collaborators that were willing to tell me when I was like going overboard, which can help, especially when you're like, oh, I want more features. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> um, okay, so. You might think that I spent a ton of time writing and rewriting the script of the game, and when I say script, I mean the conversations that happen, the voiceover, um, but there's also a ton of other stuff in the game that you were seeing in the screenshots and trailer, like the photos you open on the desktop, the blog posts, the emails, all that stuff is the writing, and then the script is the voiceover. Um, so in this process, the script came first, and um, when I started planning out the script, I knew that it should happen in three acts, so I had three acts of voiceover to write. Um, and I wanted each act to, encap to have a conversation, one conversation that encapsulated a specific detail about how Nina and Blake would later come to meet up to have sex so that the player can understand why that happens. That's sort of the goal of the game. Um, so I made this decision early on to have each act be one conversation that expresses one detail to contextualize the meeting. Um, because I knew I wanted it to be a vignette of this specific moment of meeting up. I didn't want the game to explore our whole relationship um, from beginning to end, because that lasted a long time. There's just too much there, and not everything about that relationship was very interesting to me as a writer. Um, so relationships are huge, complicated things, and I wanted to focus on one part of it that would be interesting to me as a writer, because it's just like, if you're telling the whole story of relationship, there's just so many details that are like not interesting to explore and that wouldn't make sense in this like narrative I was trying to shape. Um, and I think that the story would have lacked focus if I had done the whole, if I'd covered the whole relationship. So I picked the specific moment to focus on that I thought was interesting as a storyteller. Uh, so once I had the topic nailed down and that three-act structure, I got into the more granular details of what the conversations would be and how these characters would speak. Um, and a big part of that process was actually taking out my old laptop that I used to play Final Fantasy Online on, and this is a real screenshot from like many years ago <laughs> um, of my real character. And so we took out my laptop, it was kind of broken, but Emmett and I, uh, Emmett was also worked on the game, uh, somehow got this laptop working and ripped everything off of it onto an external hard drive. And there I was able to sift through all these screenshots that I'd taken and all these chat logs that I'd had saved. Because um, I have always been a notorious archiver of my life. Um, and I definitely took screenshots of like chat conversations that I had in this online game that I like thought were like dramatic because I was a teenager and I was like, oh my god, screenshot. Like, I want to remember that you said this. Uh, so I had a bunch of the stuff saved from when I was in a relationship with this IRL Blake figure. Um, and reading through all this stuff and looking at these screenshots and all this stuff on my old laptop helped refresh my memory and helped me nail down Blake's and Nina's voices. Um, and for Blake, it was really important because I'm not Blake. 
I can only write him from my perspective, but I wanted to write an honest character and not be biased about it. So I did a lot of research into exactly how he spoke and had tried to have critical distance from the whole scenario so I could write him as honestly as possible and without personal bias. Um, so in doing that, it's really useful to know how different types of people speak. Um, so I read through the logs and I even found an old YouTube video of a recording of us playing together in our whole group and I got to listen to him speak in that and could draw like, oh, what slang did he use? What did he sound like? Um, you know, how can I, and I took that and I was like, okay, I'm gonna use this material and write him like he really was. Um, so I think using that stuff helped me write and define Blake's voice better than I could have, could have just based on my own memories of him. Um, so I really needed this primary source material. Um, and there were only a few things I took from that stuff that like is verbatim from that in the game. Mostly I just used it as inspiration to draw from to define the voice. Um, so, of course, I also had to do a lot of investigation into how I was actually living at the time all this stuff happened, because, you know, I'm 26-year-old Nina, 18-year-old Nina was very different, and I wanted to, like, be true to that perspective of myself at that time, so I had to do research into myself, too. Um, so, I was like, what did my dorm room look like, where I was playing this game, who were my friends, what was my attitude, how did I speak, etc. Luckily, it happened during my freshman year of college, so I had tons of pictures of my living space at the time, um, and I'd also already been using AIM and Gchat, uh, so I was able to download chat logs from that to see what kind of slang I was using, how I spoke, what kinds of things I wanted to talk to my friends about. Um, and that research really helped me get into the headspace of 18-year-old Nina. So I had to get into the headspace of Blake and Nina to sort of write these conversations in an honest and realistic way. Um, and that was my real dorm room, by the way. <laughs> uh, so then, of course, I needed to populate the desktops of the game as well, because I wanted it to feel like a real computer full of stuff that 18-year-old Nina would have. Um, so I've always been an archiver, but I also used to do web design, and I made tons of websites when I was younger and kept lots of blogs from like early, I was like doing this when I was like 13 and older, um, and I went on the way back machine, I went way back machine diving and <laughs> found all my old websites that I didn't have anything saved from on my own computers. And thank God for this website because I found so much crazy stuff that made the game so much more interesting. Um, and I basically would like take these blog posts that I would find and like edit them or use them as source material or use them as inspiration um, and you know use them to populate the desktops of Sybil. Um, so that is a picture of like my real blog from when I was so young and my online name was Amy. Because <laughs> you know, your parents told you back then like don't share your real name online. It's probably still good advice, but uh, ultimately gathering all this computer detritus that I'd left behind was a process that took me a year and a half of development. I was adding pieces of ephemera to the game right up until like the month we shipped um, because the ephemera is meant to contextualize the story and help players understand the characters because you can understand them from the conversations, but you really need to see what they're thinking outside of that context to understand, you know, what are they actually thinking that they're not saying? So this stuff is there to help the player understand how to read between the lines and what these characters are actually thinking, specifically Nina, because um, you are using her computer. Um, so for example, uh, this is another picture from the Wayback Machine. I actually, this is one thing I thought about putting in the game. It's like a layout that I made for an old website a bunch of the stuff isn't loaded because the Wayback Machine doesn't preserve all the CSS or whatever. Uh, and it's a cool artifact, but I didn't put this ephemera in the game because it didn't help support the story or understanding of the characters. I have good memories associated with it, but it's not specific enough to 18-year-old Nina to really support player understanding of her. Um, I needed ephemera that would help them understand her better at this specific moment in time. So I had stuff like this birthday invitation draft that she'd written up, this picture of myself and a friend from a while ago. These things better help the player understand who Nina was because, you know, in the photo, for example, oh, Nina and her friend, maybe this was the friend she was emailing with in this, in this email that she had saved. Oh, she's turning 19, okay, she's into Pokemon, so maybe she's a little nerdy. Uh, so all the stuff that I picked to put in the desktop had to support player understanding of the characters. It couldn't just be cool stuff that I thought was awesome from my past. It had to be specifically related to the story. Um, let's see. 
So given my research, I felt ready to bang out the whole script, uh, the voiceover stuff, a few months into development. So I was kind of like going way back machine diving and trying to write some initial dialogue at the same time. It was sort of like the research phase. After I did all this research, I was ready to really write the dialogue. Um, so just like a funny story, <laughs> the script, the three acts, I wrote over the course of three days. Each day, I basically just went to this bar called The West and got kind of drunk and wrote one act each night. And that's how the whole game got written. But obviously, I edited it a lot later. But at first, it was just like three nights of like drinking. Uh, so yeah, that happened. Um, so after this initial whirlwind of ideas settled down and I'd written the script and everything, we planned to create Sybil in three weekend sessions, um, basically one game jam for each of the three acts. And after we spent the first weekend building the map loading system, <laughs> like we spent the whole weekend building it when we thought we would build a whole act of the game, we decided to reevaluate the scope of the project. Um, all the games we'd made up to that point had been short, concise games that could be made in a single weekend. Um, and we figured our plan for Sybil was straightforward enough to do that. Um, and I think we fell into this trap and made this mistake because the basic player interaction at the core of Sybil is pretty simple. It's point and click, uh, and you're exploring a desktop, and there are some short films. It sounds pretty simple. Um, but the problems come as they often do in the details. We wanted the levels to be really large, so we needed this complicated tile-based map loading system. Um, we wanted an NPC, a non-player character, to follow the player around, so we had to figure out pathfinding and nav mesh creation. We wanted Rebecca, our artist, to have maximum creative freedom in the space design, so we had to make a pixel-perfect collision system. And these and other details of the implementation are actually what took the majority of the development time. And our slow realization that we'd bit off more than we uh, could chew was pretty tough. And we were definitely overwhelmed by the complexity of the features we needed. And we did have to accept that our three weekend project was actually going to take a lot longer if we wanted to finish it and ship something polished. Uh, luckily, everyone was on board. And we proceeded to work almost every day and definitely every weekend, like full time for the next year and a half. Um, and I would never recommend that someone work the extreme amount of hours that we did, because I was in school or working full time. Everyone was working and doing this outside of work. Um, and somehow it worked for us, even though it was super exhausting. And we did manage to ship a game that we're proud of. But working every weekend in that way like really kind of burned us out. And I'm going to talk a little bit about burnout um, in, a, in a few slides. So in addition to the stress of realizing that the project was too big to finish in three weekends, halfway through the work on Sybil, I got hired at Fulbright, and Emmett and I shipped out to Portland to live here. Um, so we'd been working co-located with our collaborators um, for the first half of the project. So uh, we kind of weren't prepared to work remotely. Like, we didn't really have experience doing that. Uh, when we were working together, collaboration came naturally. We could look over each other's shoulders and comment on stuff. But when we were remote, that was a, an entirely different team dynamic that we hadn't really planned for. Um, and we should have definitely planned for it uh, in retrospect. Um, so when we realized that stuff was like kind of becoming tough when we were out in Portland, we were realizing, like, oh, we don't actually know what our collaborators are working on every weekend. Like, they're not, they didn't send us an update last weekend, so like, what are they doing? Um, so we realized that this was a big problem and was stressing us out a lot because we were like, we want to finish this game, so we need to like have better communication methods. So we started trying to use Trello, which both Emmett and I had been using at our day jobs, um, and we thought it was really good for asynchronous work, and it is. Um, and our original idea was to sort of create tasks, uh, like to-do lists in Trello based on what everyone needed to do to ship the game, um, and we did do that. Uh, however, Unfortunately, all four of us had very different working situations at the time and different ways that they wanted to work. Um, so we couldn't really settle on one co-working method because our two collaborators weren't really into Trello. It just didn't feel right to them. And we were all working as friends, so we couldn't say, like, you have to use this. Like, it was optional. Um, so Emma and I used it a ton, but we had to find other methods to support our collaborators because we didn't want to, like, force them into something they didn't like. Um, so we ended up... We never really came up with a good fail-safe method. We basically just started writing roadmaps and to-do lists and emailing them back and forth once a week with our remote collaborators, um, which worked pretty well for us, and our collaborators were into that. We definitely wanted to use Trello a lot more with them, but they just never really got into it. And we did manage to make it work out in the end, but I think 
if you're going into a situation like this where you go from like working co-located to remote suddenly, um, definitely figure out you know, what everyone's expectations are as far as communication um, and, and like what working schedules are, are like. So like, will you all be working every weekend at the same time online together or maybe you want a different schedule? Figure that stuff out ahead of time because different expectations about that can cause a lot of friction, which can be a contributing factor to burnout, which I'll talk about really briefly. Um, so as you can tell at this point, working on Sybil was pretty exhausting and a daunting challenge given that it was an outside, you know, outside of day job thing. Um, and it was the biggest game project that any of us had ever worked on. And we had a lot of communication issues because we were remote and none of us really knew how to deal with that. Um, and the combination of these new challenges with our work schedules and our weekend schedules, this caused us to feel a lot of burnout towards the end of the project. Um, and I think discussing burnout is really important because video games often take a really long time to make and working on one thing for a long time is really emotionally difficult. Um, it can sometimes feel like there's no end in sight. Uh, I remember a period of time where I had been working on Sybil every single weekend without taking a day off for six months straight. And I hadn't even like gone to the beach. Like I had taken no time off. Uh, and Emma and I, uh, my, one of my collaborators, we were working together during all those weekends here in Portland for the most part. Uh, and we also are partners who live together. Uh, so. Our full-time day jobs on top of weekend civil work put a huge strain on our relationship because we'd mostly just spend hours of time sitting across the table from each other in silence on our laptops, which is like not the best way to like have a romantic relationship. Uh, and I also stopped spending very much time with friends because all the time I spent not working on Sybil felt stressful and like it was preventing Sybil from getting done. I developed a really unhealthy relationship with my work during this time um, and I don't re recommend doing that to yourself. If you do decide to take on a project outside of work or school, I strongly urge you to schedule in breaks ahead of time. So say like, okay, next week I'm gonna take five hours off on Saturday. Or even like two, two months from now, I'm gonna take a whole week off. Schedule that stuff in ahead of time, because otherwise you might just, you know, it's easy to be passionate about a project, but it's hard to take time off from it and to feel like that's okay, or at least that was my experience. So be really, really deliberate about scheduling and time off, because I think creativity is at its best when you're relaxed and not stressed out. Um, so breaks are super important. Um, so last summer we were look, working like crazy to finish Sybil. Um, we were really burnt out and basically just wanted to be done with it. Uh, so I started to aggressively plan our release. Um, earlier in the year, I'd gotten us some nice preview coverage on Polygon, which had helped us out, and I'd shared some early builds at events, but I really needed to do a big press push so that anyone would know what Sybil was. Um, so I decided to basically take myself and Emmett to PAX, which I couldn't afford passes for, but I had been flying myself out to conferences and making connections as much as possible over the last few years. So I finally had the chance to take advantage of the network I built. So I basically sent emails to a bunch of people at different press outlets that I'd kind of met at parties or whatever, and almost all of them said yes. So we got meetings at, with IGN, GameSpot, Giant Bomb, all these cool sites that wrote about the Civil Preview at PAX, which I basically asked all of them to come meet up with me in hotel lobbies that I wasn't actually staying in because if you don't have a budget, Hotel Lobby is a good place to have a meeting. Um, <laughs> so we did that and that was a really great press push and I was like, okay, now people are talking about it, some dialogue about the game, let's ride this press wave to release so that it comes out while people are still talking about it. Um, and also Fallout was coming out soon, I didn't want to compete with that. So I was like, we're gonna come out before Fallout. <laughs> um, so we decided to release on November 2nd. This is just a screenshot of the email that I sent out two weeks before release to press, media people, and friends. Um, there was a Steam key at the bottom, so I gave a huge network of people an early build and was just like, play this. Like, if you want to talk about it, please do. Like, we appreciate the support. This is sort of like my having no budget marketing method. It's like, go to as many parties as possible and get everyone's email and then send them early builds and ask them to talk about it. And to be honest, that worked really well for us. Um, so release day came around and it was pretty terrifying but also super exciting. Launch went almost perfectly except for a panic attack I had because I messed up a launch discount on Steam and couldn't fix it myself, so I was like emailing with Steam people. It was really stressful, but it got fixed and everything went smoothly, so that was good. Um, 
And we were really fortunate to make a game that a lot of people ended up connecting with. Um, so I got a zillion emails from all sorts of people telling me that they had had online boyfriends or girlfriends or that their friends had and that the game felt very real to them in that way because they either had experienced something like that or knew that it was a thing. Um, and I had some other people telling me that it offered them a perspective um, on relationships that they hadn't considered before because maybe they hadn't had an online dating situation. And I think my favorite email I got was from a 17-year-old girl who said, and I quote, I'm 17 and I'm really not sure what love is yet, but I think I feel closer to knowing after playing this. So yes, making and releasing Sybil was a really powerful experience. Um, and then we won, this is a picture from when we won the Nuovo Award at IGF, which was an emotional roller coaster. And it was especially an emotional roller coaster because this all came to fruition after what I was describing, which was burnout, weekends working for six months without a break, just a really, you know, we worked a ton to get this thing to come together. And it was definitely messy and we never managed to nail down a perfect workflow. And we never got rid of every bug, I mean, who does? And we almost gave up after getting completely burnt out. But we learned a ton from this experience about a bunch of things, like keeping the scope of a project small, how to iterate on an idea until it works, how to use playtesting to support iteration, how to work on a small team with friends, um, and how important breaks are when you're working every single weekend and after work. Um, so it was a really magical learning experience, and if there's any takeaway from this, it's that you know, whether you're a student or someone who's trying to make something after work, you're trying to like follow your passion, whatever it may be, sort of outside of your normal schedule. It gets really stressful, take breaks, but you can make it work and you can do really well. There's always hope if you work really hard. Um, so I'm excited to use the lessons I learned from Sybil to make bigger and crazier stuff in the future. And I hope that you learned something from my talk. Uh, and that's my site and Twitter. Thank you.